Amen. 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 All right. All right. We're talking about miracles today. So in this series, this is week two, uh, it's Lord over all. It's, it's Jesus is Lord over all. So there's a lot of things in all. And Jesus is Lord over all of them. Amen. And when he came and he did his miracles, as, as, as he took on human form and he walked the earth in his ministry, and we see that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we see in the miracles of Jesus is not only his love, but his power over every single aspect of this universe. And so last week, we looked at the wedding in Cana, and we had a little bride and a little groom and a little wedding, and they had a little problem. Do you remember? They ran out of wine. And Jesus didn't care that the problem was a little problem. He came into their little problem and he turned water into wine and he solved that for them. And not only is he Lord over nature itself, but the personality and character of Jesus is he doesn't just answer your big prayer requests today. He cares about everything in your life. And we love him for that. So today he's going to be Lord over distance over any distance that exists in your life. Let me read this passage of scripture to you real quick. John 5, and this is just, Jesus is talking about himself here. He says, I assure you that the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he is guaranteed that the same life-giving power to the Son. What does that mean? This is huge. If you're trying to understand who Jesus is and the way that he works and the way that miracles work, this is a fundamental core passage of scripture because he says something interesting about himself. It's like he peels back spiritual reality for just a minute, pulls back the veil and lets you see inside. And he said, there's something about me as the son of God. I have life in myself and I have the ability because I've got life in myself to give life to anybody that I want to give it to. See, God's a creator. He's not someone who shapes and manufactures out of somebody else's raw materials. God makes things. And he gives power and he gives life where there's death. See, we're, we moms and dads in the rooms, we know that we can have kids. Right? We can have little versions of us running around, little tykes, right? And it's mom's eyes and dad's personality and... And we see our DNA pass on. And God gave us the ability to do that, to have children and to have future generations. But what are we doing? We're copying the DNA and the design that he created for us. And every animal and every plant does the exact same thing down through the ages. But we do not actually create life. That's a whole different category. Right? And even, even in our, our study of science, and I love science, and I love all that science has done for us. Indoor plumbing, Amen. Amen. Thank God. But it's like, what have we done? Well, we have observed, we've analyzed, and we've learned. And we've learned even in certain uh, situations how to mix chemicals. And we've learned how to impact natural processes. And, and, and even our, our healers, our doctors, and our nurses in some ways can do certain things in order to encourage healing. But we cannot bring life. Not really. And in our day and age, we've learned so much. We've become so advanced, have we not? And we can look back on the previous generations and say, we've learned so much. We have so much knowledge and expertise and technology. And we can look back at previous generations like they're barbarians and say, we've come so far in our conceit and our overconfidence. And you hit us with a pandemic like this last year and we just... We, we get hit all over again with just how limited we really are. And Jesus comes into that scenario and says, I have life in myself. I'm a different category. And I can give life to whoever I want to. Can you imagine the creative force that created the universe existed in the walking and talking son of God? The deaf will hear. The blind will see. The lame will walk. Amen? Amen. Here's today's miracle. Go to Luke chapter 7, verse 1. That's what we're going to be reading out of. Luke chapter 7, verse 1. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered a town called Capernaum. Let me tell you about Capernaum just really quickly. Capernaum is Jesus' town. It's where he made his home base. 
He was born in Bethlehem. You remember that from Christmas. He grew up in a place called Nazareth. But when he started his adult ministry with his disciples, he moved to a town called Capernaum. And it is Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, if you're a note taker, where it says this was Jesus' own town. He spent a lot of time in Capernaum. Capernaum is even the place, you guys might remember this, where there was a certain house and Jesus was healing people in the house. And it had drawn so many sick people and so many observers that they were a mob around the house that Jesus was in. And then there was a lame man who was on a cot and his friends couldn't get him in the front door. Do you remember that? And so they lowered him down through the ceiling. That all happened at Capernaum. Jesus had a reputation in that town. They knew his miracles if you were someone who lived in Capernaum. And this takes place in Capernaum. Verse 2, there was a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly and he was sick and about to die. And the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. Again, the servant has heard of Jesus. He lives in Jesus' town. So he not only has heard of Jesus, maybe he's even seen some of the miracles firsthand. But his servant is sick, and so he knows, I've got to get Jesus involved in this thing. Now let's talk about Centurion for a second. A lot of characters in this story. We're going to have to describe each one so that you get the full weight of the drama that's going on here. The Centurion. The Centurion was the highest rank enlisted officer in the Roman army. Now, I was talking to uh, an officer who was one of the elders here at our church. He's sitting right over there. Don't look at him, but he's sitting right over there. And he and I were talking on the phone this week because I'm like, I got to get a soldier's perspective on this guy, you know? And uh, in, in the United States Army, the highest enlisted officer rank is uh, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major. And that's what this guy was. And he would oversee between 80 and 100 different soldiers in battle. He had to be at least 30 years old in order to be a Roman centurion. And the reason was is because you had to be proven in battle. You were a career soldier. You weren't just a part of one war. You were a career soldier. And you had to be 30 years old. You had, to, you had to have survived that long, amen, to be respected for your, for your commands, for your advice, to be heeded. They also had to be literate, which was unique in that day and age. He had to be literate because if written commands were issued in the midst of battle, he had to be able to read the commands and he had to be able to write new commands. So that's just kind of a picture of the centurion. Now, he was not privileged in society. He was not necessarily wealthy. Now, you're going to see he makes a large donation here in just a minute, but he's not necessarily wealthy. But for that particular context, as poor of a village as that was, he would have been seen as very financially stable. He had means. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you, you don't have to be wealthy and privileged in order to have means. And he has means. Now, look at the servant. The servant is a trusted servant of the centurion. And he's sick and he's about to die. What's unique about this is that in Roman law at that time, if you had a servant, you were, you were legally okay to kill the servant if the servant was sick. You're like, well, that's shocking, right? But think about it through their lens um, servants in the, that, that day and age did not have many rights. They were not respected. And if you were paying this individual, if you were feeding this individual to get things done for you, and they could no longer get things done for you, you were able to just put them out of their misery, basically. Isn't that rough? It's rough. But you need to know that that was even expected of a Roman centurion but his servant, who he cares about, that's the point. He cares about this guy, sick, almost dead, and he reaches out to Jesus, and I love that. Verse 4, when they, and this is the Jewish leaders here, when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. You're like, you changed your tone of voice there. Yes, I did. These are the Jewish leaders. These are the, the officials. These are the people that are in charge of not only the Jewish religion, but really basically of that town. And he calls them. And what do they say to Jesus? They say, Jesus, this man deserves this. Like, Jesus, you got so many miracles in your miracle bucket to give out. This guy deserves one of them. Now, this is kind of a shocking thing for them to say. 
Uh, Partly it's shocking because they didn't have a really great relationship with Gentiles as a whole. You're going to see that come up in the story in just a minute. They saw Gentiles as unclean. If you're not part of God's chosen people, you're unclean. And if we walk into your house, we could get unclean. Some of your, you know, not so holy nests might rub off on us, make us less holy. It's kind of the idea. So they had issues. They also had issues with Romans because the Romans were an occupying force. They saw themselves as God's people having their own country. And the fact that Rome came in and, and defeated them and occupied their country, that was not good news for them. There's a lot of negativity, a lot of negative feelings toward the Romans. So you've got all that, and now you've got some Jewish leaders who somehow get past his Gentileness, his Romanness, and they say, Jesus, he deserves a miracle from you. And this, this to, to the original audience that read this story or watched this thing unfold, they would have been very surprised that they came talking like this to Jesus. But look closer. Jesus, he deserves it. Why? Because he loves our people and he built our synagogue. He built us a church building, Jesus. This guy deserves something. Religious people always keep score. Always. Religious people, this is, this is the air that they breathe. If you have avoided enough sin and if you've done enough good things, then you deserve stuff from us and you deserve stuff from God. And it's wrong. And it's always, always wrong. And that is not the grace of Jesus Christ, amen? You could say that louder, second service, amen? Because, man, that's it. Not only are we saved by the grace of God, which means we don't deserve anything, but it's not just for salvation. Grace should be the air that we breathe. It's the foundation of everything we do every single day of our lives. It never stops being grace. You don't start with grace and then start earning stuff with God. That's not the way that it works. And Jesus isn't going to work that way. And the way that they talk about him deserving is just so wrong. My grandfather, he, he, he was, uh, I remember he's listening to, to a televangelist one time, which is uh, what we used to call those people at that time, televangelists. And this televangelist said, if you send in so much money, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you this special leather Bible and you'll, you'll be accepted into my special giver's club, basically. And he wrestled over that decision. And I just remember that, watching that unfold with him. And he ended up doing it. And then he regretted it later on, having done that thing. And and, and none of it felt right to me. And I've seen other stories like this unfold as well in the church. But it never felt right to me. But why, why did it feel right? I was even a kid. I didn't even know Jesus very well. But it didn't feel right. And the reason it wasn't right is because you don't buy your way into the kingdom of God. You don't buy your way into any special echelon of spiritual maturity ever. And you don't buy it with money, and you don't buy it with your service, and you don't buy it with your attendance. And sometimes, and some of us have been part of of churches before where we knew that if I'm going to be in the in crowd and I'm going to be in the club here, I've got to get on these serving teams. And I've got to attend these special events and these special meetings and I've got to do it enough and then I'll be looked at a particular way. And we've all fallen into it. But it's a trap. We can't let that be in the church. That can't be here at Grace Fellowship. It just can't. Because it will mess with us. Because if we can earn God's favor and his miracle, we can unearn it as well and live in a place of guilt and law for the rest of our lives. It's not the gospel. Amen? Amen. I spent too long on that point. I was just having fun with it. Um, just so you know, too, archaeologists have found modern day, the, the, the modern day ruins of ancient Capernaum. In 1905, there was an excavation done, and the name of the, the modern city, where have I got that? Kafar Nahum. In 1905, they found the ruins of Capernaum. It's one of the the major tourist sites. If you were to go to Israel today, you can actually visit this place. And not only can you see the the, the Roman garrison barracks that are still, they've still got the ruins of them today, but you can also see this synagogue that this centurion built. And it's, it's just some cool stuff that you can see. Now, he's a smart soldier, right? Like, he he's not just a centurion, 
but he's a smart soldier. I, I learned this from uh, this, this, uh, this soldier that's here at Grace, um, told me that when he was part of um, Oper- Operation Iraqi Freedom, I'm going to try and get that right, and they went in to Iraq, and we took a force into that nation. He said there were soldiers that could have gone in and hated the, the native people that were there. They could have disrespected them, treated them poorly. And sometimes, of course, that happens. He's like, but the smart soldiers will go in and learn how to respect the native people, how to, how to respect them, how to learn their culture, how to work with them, how to become partners with them, and eventually even love the people and serve them there. That's, that's wisdom. That's just good humanity, amen? Amen. And soldiers should do that. And so when we've got a soldier here in this picture who built their church building for them in that town, again, I just, I want you to see the kind of centurion that we're talking about here. All right, more. Verse six, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house. And when the centurion sent friends, and then, sorry, the the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Jesus isn't bothered by the fact that he's a Gentile or a Roman. Jesus is just rushing toward his house. But the centurion thinks he might be bothered by it. For you understand the drama, you got to see that tension there. Is the centurion knows that as a Gentile and as a Roman, if Jesus, if this Jewish rabbi comes to his house, there might be stories that start going around. And even though he's done so much for them, he doesn't want drama for Jesus. And I just kind of love that about him. He's actually, he's selfless toward his servant, and he's also selfless toward Jesus and says, you don't have to come here. Uh, Pastor David Guzik said it like this. He said, he didn't know Jesus well enough to know that Jesus would not feel awkward in the least, but his consideration of Jesus in this situation was impressive in his concern for both the servant and for Jesus. This centurion was an other-centered person. He's special. Verse seven, this is why still the centurion talking here. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, Jesus, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. This guy understands chain of command. Like I understand chain of command in concept, but I'm not a military person. Some of you guys in this room, you live chain of command. It's your every day. And so this guy reads this whole spiritual moment through the lens of what he understands. Do you notice that? I think it's one of God's blessings in every single profession, honestly. I think there's a different part of God that we're able to see through our professions if we look and seek God in that. I, I remember when I first became a husband, I saw different parts of God through being a husband than I had ever seen before. When I first became a father, I understood things about God the Father. Some of you guys are, 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 are nurses and doctors, and you, you understand some of the things that we're talking about with the healing of people. And it's just, there are things that you see that I don't see. And as a soldier, he sees things that we don't see. He looks at Jesus and he says, this is a, com- uh, a chain of command issue. I know how to give orders, and people darn well better obey my orders, right? He says, Jesus, you give orders too because you're a boss, and you're an authority, and he recognizes him from far away that way and says, this is a a chain of command issue. Now, let's analyze this for just a quick sec. He says Jesus can give an order, and it'll just be done, and his servant will be healed. Who does he expect Jesus is giving the order to? Because he doesn't say. It's a bit of a mystery in the passage. Because if, if I was standing there next to Jesus, I, I might wonder that. Who's getting the orders here, Jesus? He says, you can just give an order and the guy will be healed. Now, one possibility, so I'm going to give you my guesses, right? So one possibility is that he's thinking, you know what? Jesus can heal. He's probably trained his disciples to heal too. He can send one of his disciples over to my house. They'll do the healing. Jesus doesn't have to get his hands dirty. One possibility. Next possibility, maybe the guy understands the spiritual realm just a little bit, angels and demons. Maybe he thinks Jesus is going to dispatch some angels spiritually somehow to come over to his house and to make the miracle happen. Or, and this is really, really crazy, 
Maybe he understands the omnipresence of God and that God is everywhere at all moments. And maybe he understands that when Jesus issues commands, that the the level of power that Jesus operates at, remember he has life in himself. Maybe he can command the tissue in the body to do exactly what Jesus wants it to do. He can command the organs. He can command the chemicals. He can command even spirits that might be involved in that man's sickness. Maybe he can command a sickness out of this man's body. I don't know. And the truth is, I don't think he knew either. I just think he said it. Jesus commands somebody, command something. I don't have to know. I'm not picky. Jesus, would you just get the guy healed? We could use that kind of surrender in our prayer life today. Couldn't we? Have you ever been praying with somebody and you're in this group prayer situation and, and they're like an older Christian, right? And they're super mature and super good at this whole church thing and they're just awesome when they go to pray, you know? It all gets Shakespearean and wonderful and, and it's just, it's beautiful poetry, right? But as they, as they start to pray, it's like they start telling God exactly how he ought to heal the person and they put all the detail together And they picture the entire thing is exactly how it's supposed to happen. And that's cool and that's impressive, but it can intimidate the rest of us. Like, oh God, you know, next time I pray, it's like, I'm going to have to do that? I just don't don't know how you'll do it. You know, like the centurion is great here. He's he's here for you in your prayer life because this guy doesn't know how it's going to happen. And I kind of love that. I kind of love that he just says, Jesus, you're going to give an order to somebody. Would you just do it? And I don't need to know how. Just do it. I love that. Um, You do not have to know how God does the thing. Just believe that he can do the thing. Don't be picky in your prayer life. Just ask God. Be a child, right? Didn't Jesus say? "We've We've got to become like children. That's in your prayer life too. Okay, verse nine. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I've not found such great faith in Israel. And t- then, the, then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So you got to see the scene. So Jesus is walking along with these Jewish leaders, probably Jesus' disciples, right? Walking along the road and they come back to him and they say, this is, this is the speech the centurion just gave you. Jesus stops dead in his tracks and says, he's amazed. And there's a Greek word for for amaze. It's thalmazo. I have no idea if that's pronounced correctly. Thalmazo. And it means to wonder by implication to admire. That's the Greek word there. It it only shows up two times in the New Testament in relation to Jesus. And, And it's this time Jesus is amazed at this man's faith. It shows up one other time. And it's when Jesus is in in Nazareth. And and you might remember the scene. And Jesus is trying to do ministry in Nazareth. And they say, aren't you Joseph's son? Didn't we watch you grow up? And they had no faith in him whatsoever. And it says Jesus was not able to do many miracles there in that city because of their lack of faith. And at the time, it says Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Same Greek word. So in one moment, he's amazed at lack of faith. And in the other, he's amazed at the centurion's faith. And I love that. And I love that he stops. And you might read this story and think, well, why didn't Jesus just go on, a, on, on along to his house and, and say, I'll, I'll come in and, and, and I know you say I don't have to, but I will and, and I do love you and, and this Roman thing doesn't bother me and Jesus could have done all of that, but he doesn't. See, the man said, I have faith that you don't need to and Jesus honors and respects his faith by saying, then I will heal from a distance. I just think that's cool. Yeah. Jesus knows what he's doing. Okay, and here's the funniest part of the passage. So Jesus not only is amazed at his faith, but he turns to everybody around and says, I've not found such great faith in all Israel. And here's the Jewish leaders standing there. And what I wouldn't give to see the look on their faces when Jesus said that, because that's gotta be the craziest Jesus slam in all the gospels I think I've ever seen. We're standing here, Jesus. Here we are, the religious leaders, the pastors and priests of that time. And Jesus says, in the entire country, 
The best faith I've ever seen is from this Roman centurion. Whoa! But we know all this stuff. Do you know most of those people had to have the Old Testament memorized, at least the first five books, the Torah? They had them memorized. They knew all of this theology. They were dedicated across their whole life to the way of God and the faith of God. And you're saying, he's better? You see how much Jesus values faith. He values faith over our religion, over our good works. He values faith. Ooh, that should get us. Okay. And then, of course, the story ends. Jesus heals the servant. Happens in the same hour just because he's showing off, right? He's going to get the time all worked out there perfectly. I love that. Soldiers can have great faith. So application. Soldiers can have great faith. I think this is interesting. This centurion that shows up and does all this cool stuff. And I started studying centurions this week. And I found centurions show up in nine different, at least the, the ones that I counted, nine different stories throughout the New Testament. So I'm going to give you a tiny slide here. Not that you got to write all this down because you're going to kill yourselves. Don't do it. Um, but I just want you to see. Centurions, Roman soldiers show up. So today's passage in Luke 7, of course, and then in Matthew 27, a centurion sees Jesus on the cross. He's the one who says, surely he was the son of God. Some of you guys know that passage. In Mark 14, it's a centurion that reports to Pilate that Jesus had for sure died. And his testimony is why we know that when Jesus rose back again to life, he did not swoon or faint on that cross. He really died, amen? It was a real miracle. Acts 10, a centurion named Cornelius. We had two of them have got names in the scripture. A centurion named Cornelius was a God-fearer, which means he knew the Jewish religion, but had not yet become a Christian. And the apostle Peter goes to his house, and he and his entire household become Christians. It's an amazing story. Acts 22, a centurion saves Paul from flogging. He goes to, to beat Paul, and Paul looks up at him and says, you know I'm a Roman citizen, right? And he says, well, I better not beat you then. Is kind of how that story goes. It's a centurion does that. Uh, Acts 23, centurion saves Paul from a plot to kill him. In that passage, there's actually two different centurions that help Paul through that episode. Acts 24, it's a centurion that guards Paul while he's under house arrest and treats him very well. And then in Acts 27, it's a, another centurion named Julius, and he escorts Paul all the way to Rome, which is where his legal appeal is supposed to happen with Caesar. It's all in the book of Acts, but they travel by ship on the way there. It's a shipwreck, and there's all kinds of cool things that happen between Paul and the centurion. Centurions show up in the Bible. There's something about soldiers, and there's something about career soldiers who become officers that show up in the scripture. I don't think that's an accident. I think we're supposed to see that. I think we're supposed to know that. I think there's something about the soldier's life and the impulses that drive them that open up their hearts to faith. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say all soldiers are awesome today. I actually don't believe in that kind of talk. Like when we say, hey, all, all soldiers are great or, or all policemen are great or all stay-at-home moms are great, I think that gets funky just a little bit because they aren't all necessarily. Are we Okay. I think each one that pursues the way of Jesus is great. And I think there's wonderful things that they're capable of. And I don't need to bash them as a group or lift them up as a group. But let's talk about centurions and our soldiers here for just a quick second. Think about the impulse that drives them. And you're like, well, maybe they're just violent, angry people that played too many video games growing up. <laughs> I mean, maybe a few, right? But it's unfair to, to, again, to categorize. The soldiers that I know have a strong drive inside of them to protect those who cannot protect themselves. They're willing to serve, they're willing to sacrifice, they're willing to die. And the sacrifice we know, especially in a town like, like Fort Sill and Lawton here, we know that, that their sacrifice is not just about battles where weapons are drawn, their sacrifices all the time as they PCS from, from different base to different base, as they go on deployments and their families work that out. It is, it is, it's heavy what they give to us. Amen? You've seen it. It's a lot what they give to us. 
And we pray for them. And we're so glad to be a church that ministers to soldiers and soldiers minister to us here as well. I think it's a huge deal. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3, it says, The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and army he has hurled into the sea. The finest of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the sea. Did you know God is described as a warrior? Because there are things he is at war against and he is willing to fight. And if you look at the scripture honestly, you'll see it. Just like a soldier, God lays down his life so that others can live. Just like a soldier, God is willing to pay the price so that others can be free. Amen? You're a little quiet, second service. And just like a soldier, God wages war with Satan and sin and with death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And I know I don't have that one on your screens. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Do you see the biblical language there? We are at war with death itself. In a year like COVID, we get that. We understand that. We want death to go down, amen? You ever been to a funeral? I want death to go down. I look forward to the day death goes down. And the idea that God is the one who stands against death and that God has a plan for death, to take it out, to take it down, and that we don't have to live with death throughout eternity, that's a good thing. And I love that he's a warrior, and I love that he's willing to fight. So the centurion, again, he's battle-proven. He's over 30 years of age. He knows what it is to be in battle and not only survive that battle and make smart decisions, but he gives orders that young soldiers have to follow, potentially to their death. That's the level of serious this person is. And he looks at Jesus Christ and says, I recognize your authority. And I see you, Jesus, and you're the boss. And I'll do what you say. That's gravity. Jesus looks at his faith, and Jesus is amazed at his faith and inspired by his faith. So how do we have the faith that the centurion had? I think there's three ways. The centurion, the the unique aspect of the centurion's faith is that he saw Jesus as conquering distance. You don't have to come to my house, Jesus. Distance doesn't matter. And I love this, that we struggle with how to pray in our prayer life. Let's be real about that, right? Prayer is one of those hard things in the Christian life. No one can explain it well enough to us. And a lot of times we get intimidated about it. We know it's one of those things. We know we never do it enough. We never do it well enough, right? Like, here comes the condemnation. Let's go. How do we pray? And I think the centurion, his faith, is a critical thing that we need inside of our prayer life because I think it's going to calm us down and show us what faith is actually all about. Just very, very simply, he believes Jesus can cross the distance. And he, there's three distances I'm going to give you. It's physical distance, emotional distance, and sinful distance. And I think you'll see all three of them. But we struggle with this. We, we struggle to believe that God can really cross the distance for us. We struggle to believe that Jesus is really everywhere that we need him to be. And can we be honest with that? I, I, I saw it just this week, and, and we prayed for Tim earlier, and, and, and Tim's in, in, in the ICU, and I got to see him yesterday with his wife. And we got to pray with him, and it was so, so good. But some of you this last year, you've dropped family members off at the ER who had COVID, and they told you you could not come in. And you had someone who you loved and you were worried about and you could not be in the same room with them. And when you went to pray for that family member, that friend, you struggled. Because you struggled to believe that God could really work in that hospital room that was far enough away from you. And that's human. And I get it. But we need to see this today with this centurion. That he knew distance did not matter. I mean, it's just, it seems so simple, right? We learned this in Sunday school. But it matters to us, and we forget. And we need this kind of faith in our prayer life to come right back in and to know it's like, I may be over here, and they may be in this hospital room, but I don't care how lonely that place feels. Jesus is there. And I can pray a prayer for that person over there, and I don't need Jesus like some cheap musician or a magician to be able to walk up and me physically see him wave his hands over the person to do his magic trick. 
It's not the way he works. He's the Lord of glory and he's got life in himself. And he can go anywhere. And some of you have kids that live states away from you and your heart breaks for them because you can't be in their physical presence. And again, it's human. And when you pray, you struggle like, God, can you actually answer my prayers for them when they're not right in front of me? Yes, he can. So you don't have to be brilliant today in order to pray well. You just need the faith of a centurion. That's all you need. That's easy, isn't it? This uneducated, unchurched, first century soldier guy, all you need is his faith to just believe that God can. Next is the emotional distance. How many times do you go to pray and you're like, God, I really need you to care about this person that I care about. And if you took a, took a real look at what you're, what you're saying to God, a lot of times you're trying to arm twist your father in heaven to actually care for this person that you care about. And he already does. He already cares more than you do for this person, right? This person is his child. He loves them. And it's like sometimes we, we think that God is just like another human being that doesn't know the person and that there's emotional distance there. There is never emotional distance with God. You do not have to convince him and you do not have to twist his arm, amen? Pray believing. Again, it's faith. Pray believing. God, I know you don't care about distance. And God, I know you already know the person and love them. You've been waiting around for me to pray this prayer. Thank you, God. How simple that can be. And the third one, it's the sinful distance. And as soon as you start praying, as soon as it gets serious, as soon as it's critical, right? And I know people are moving around for the baptism. Just pretend that you're listening to me, right? Just keep nodding. <laughs> if you're anything like me, as soon as you start praying for serious stuff and you're not just making speeches to God, and you're not on prayer autopilot. You ever do that in the car, prayer autopilot? You're like, I've been praying for like 10 minutes. I've been saying stuff to God. What did I even say? But it's serious. When you go to pray something important to yourself, what immediately floods back into your mind, if you're anything like me, is, God, I know I don't deserve this. God, I can see my sin. I can see the things I shouldn't have done, and I did. And I know that when I come and I ask for this big miracle from you, I know I don't deserve you, you to give this to me. And sometimes I go off into this little rabbit trail of like, I better confess everything that I can possibly think of ever because I've really got to make sure God's going to answer this one. You're seeing a distance that doesn't exist. If you are in Jesus Christ today and you've surrendered your life to him, he took care of all that distance on the cross. He paid for every single sin. Every single righteous act that he did has been brought to your account. That's what Romans says. And when God sees you as his child, he sees you through the lens of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And by his blood, he loves you and you're worthy. And then when you speak those things, there is no sinful distance between you and God. He will answer your prayers. Oh, I got to read this because it's too good. Psalm 103, real quick. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let this into your soul. Slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. This is the cross. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens are above the earth. Number, verse 12, life-changing verse. He has removed your sins as far as as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children. Look how much he understands us. Tender and he's compassionate to those who fear him for he knows how weak we are and he remembers we're only dust. So when you come praying, say, God, I'm only dust and you get me, God. And I love that. Is that good news to anybody here today? Would you guys stand? We're going to pray and we're going to sing. And some people are going to get dunked in some water. It's going to be good. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
I pray, Lord, that you would come and that your truth would cause us to believe today and that your truth would change us. Lord, your word says that there's something about us gazing into the face of Jesus that you start to change us and we start to become like him in his nature, in his likeness, God. I pray that that would be the case. Thank you for the word of God that, that, that often it's got such buried treasure inside of it, Lord, but, but when we get it, when we look and when we trust you, there's some life-changing stuff there for us. No distance, Lord, we declare it to you. No distance matters. We don't have to understand. We just have to believe that you will. Would you bring this kind of faith to us today? In Christ's name, amen.